Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the 42nd Annual Distinguished Faculty Lecture. My name is Uriah Kim and I am the GTU Dean. Please remember that there is a reception with food and drinks immediately following the lecture in the Bade Museum, which is right across the plaza. And I'd like to thank Wendy Arce and Thomas Calabrese and their crew of student assistants for setting up the reception. They work all day today. I'm convinced that Arthur Order, my predecessor, for those who don't know him, had perfected the art of being the DTU Dean during his long and outstanding tenure. One example of this is that every document that I read in his file had been very thoughtfully crafted, hitting just the right tenor and tone for each occasion, individual, or group. So if what I say tonight sounds awfully familiar and appropriate, <laughs> it's probably because I'm using Arthur's script verbatim. <laughs> if what I say tonight sounds un unfamiliar and somewhat clumsy, it's probably from me. So what is the distinguished faculty lecturer? Always a highlight in our consortial calendar. This lecture gives us a chance to honor a member of the faculty whose scholarship exemplifies a kind of faith-filled wisdom that we value and hope to nourish here for the sake of our religious communities and the wider society. Nomination for the Distinguished Faculty Lecturer comes from the faculties of the member schools, there are eight of them, and the roster faculty of the GTU itself, who are invited to nominate one person from any GTU school except their own. <laughs> the Council of Deans, there are nine of them, then reviews the nominations and make the final selection. What this means is that the consortial faculty, about 110 of them, is choosing one person each year whose scholarship they respect enough to set forth as a representative of the highest standards of this ecumenical and interreligious community of scholars. Before we introduce this year's distinguished faculty lecturer, and I know you guys are very anxious to know who it is, <laughs> I would like to first introduce the respondent. It is indeed with a delightful heart that I introduce Margaret Miles, who is Professor Emerita of Historical Theology at the GTU. She graduated from the GTU with a PhD in 1977, was the first recipient of the GTU Alum of the Year in 1991, and served as its dean from 1996 until her retirement in 2002. Prior to coming back to the DTU, she was the Bussey Professor of Theology and the first tenured woman at Harvard University Divinity School from 1978 to 1996. She's a widely known scholar and writer of history of Christian thoughts. She authored 18 books. And her con contribution to the field of religious and theological studies was, re rec rec was recognized and honored when she was elected as president of the American Academy of Religion in 1999. Thank you, Dean Miles. And we look forward to hearing from you the response. Moreover, we will have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions and, and, and answers after the response. Now I invite Rhys Potterfeld, the president of the DTU, who will have the honor of introducing the distinguished lecture, faculty lecturer for 2017. I'm pleased to introduce this evening Dr. Nomi Seidman. She is the correct professor of Jewish culture at the Graduate Theological Union. She's been a member of the core doctoral faculty 
and for many years was also the director of the Center for Jewish Studies. Naomi has a wide-ranging set of intellectual and research interests, including translation studies, the sexual transformation of Ashkenaz, psychoanalysis and translation, issues of sexuality and gender, and Orthodox Judaism. And Rhea is just like a sliver of her, and she is a Renaissance woman in terms of having um, a curiosity and interest in a wide range of topics. Um, Emmanuel Levinas is now appearing in courses, and I understand that's become a new interest of hers. Um, she has emerged as a very significant and important scholar in Jewish studies, and this has been recognized the uh, year 2016. She won the very competitive Guggenheim Fellowship uh, and spent the year in New York City. But she won at the same time a grant from the National Endowment uh, for the Humanities uh, from the Center for Jewish History. And so this was a, an award for senior scholars. And senior in this case is not old. <laughs> Uh, but it is someone who is developing a very significant voice and contribution within the field. So she spent that year, and I asked her several times to explain what she was working on, and she finally sent me a short email. This is when the email was still working. <laughs> <laughs> it's been out now for almost a week, so you can imagine it's the descent of chaos. <laughs> But she, uh, she sent me these words, and I want to just share them with you uh, before I yield the pulpit. A general idea arose in Jewish modernity that Jews spoke a European language that only thinly concealed a deeper and more authentic language, Yiddish. In jokes, folklore, and eventually psychoanalytic case studies, Yiddish erupted from beneath the civilized languages that were supposed to cover it. This structure is both linguistic and psychic, and it shaped the understanding not only of the specificities of Jewish multilingualism, but also of the stratified constitution of the modern Jewish self. So tonight her lecture will be when Jesus spoke Yiddish, translating the New Testament for Jews. Now me. I'm glad that you got the telegram, the smoke signals. I don't know how you guys found out about this like um, So thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. And it's a really great honor to get this distinguished faculty lecture. As you heard, um, it's your, your colleagues vote for you to get it. So it just feels so great. I've just been walking around for days feeling so distinguished. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, maybe it'll last for a few more days too. Um, and, and there are just so many other people to thank. My family is here. Um, I won't point them out. Um, the Torah study group from the Tivot Shalom is here. There are so many people from that. Ben Stern. Um, some people from a, a Yiddish group that I, I have been uh, organizing, uh, my students, and see the Levinas class, the Bible translation class. Um, um, maybe I'll just say one thing about the GTU, which is that the GTU, I, there's no doubt that I, the reason I'm doing this work is because I teach at the GTU. I didn't, I, my degree was in comparative literature. I didn't really know anything about Christianity. I didn't know the difference between, I guess I still don't, <laughs> Methodism and Episcopalianism. And I've just learned so much and, and I came to this topic because I teach here. And um, originally I thought that this, this 
job I suddenly had to be teaching Jewish studies in a multi-religious framework was a, was going to be about dialogue, religious dialogue, and maybe especially Jewish-Christian dialogue, because one of the first things that happened at the GTU when they came together in the 60s was that a Center for Jewish Studies was founded. Oh, and then David Beale was here too. Uh, one of the early professors at the GTU really built uh, CJS. And um, there actually hasn't been that much dialogue, I don't think. Um, there's been something a little bit more profound, I would say. And the way I articulated it to myself, uh, walking around today thinking about what I would say, is that um, as opposed to having a religious dialogue here, we've thrown in our lot together. Um, and I, the thing, it's just that feeling of the things I've gone through people in this room have been so important and so powerful and there are so many people that I love here. And I'll just say that one of the things that Uriah didn't, um, and thank you Uriah, thank you Reese for that introduction, but Uriah didn't explain that the distinguished faculty lecturer gets to pick the respondent. and. Um, I picked Margaret, because, not only because of her 18 books, I actually was shocked to discover that looking her up on my phone today, and I, I'm, I'm the impression that I might suddenly have to introduce her, um, and I'll just say that uh, she never struck me as somebody who had written 18 books when I knew her, so that was news to me, but I picked her also just because I love her so much. Um, and many other people in this room, Dina. If I start saying who they are, I'll forget somebody, so. Okay, I think that's my little thank you. So, when Jesus spoke Yiddish, and I'll just start by conceding that I am well aware that the story of Yiddish translations of the New Testament is a minor footnote in any history you might be telling, Jewish history, Christian history, translation history, etc. But that just makes it all the more curious that among the first four or five Yiddish books ever printed was Paul Halich's translation of the New Testament. Uh-oh. Sorry, where's Wendy? The translation, which we're going to see a picture of any minute now, appeared in 1540, only six years. Is that working? No. That's where we tested it earlier. Okay. There we go. You wouldn't want to miss that, would you? Um, <laughs> the translation appeared in 1540. That was only six years after the three Hitler brothers founded the first Hebrew language press in Poland, and three years after they converted as a group to Roman Catholicism, a conversion that may have had something to do with the press's financial difficulties. <laughs> Just saying. To put this in context, Martin Luther's German New Testament translation appeared in 1522, only 18 years earlier. The timing of this last detail is no coincidence. Despite being a new Catholic, Halich was happy to ride Luther's coattails, relying on the overlap between German and Yiddish to produce a Yiddish translation that was more or less a transcription of Luther's German into Hebrew characters. Wow. Halich seemed to have been barely paying attention as he carried out his work. Or maybe he was just fuzzy about the details of his new religion. <laughs> Although he dedicated the volume to the Archbishop of Krakow in the pious hope that his translation would bring errant Jews to true Catholic faith, in Romans 3.28, he faithfully repeated Luther's Protestant heresy, adding the word align to the famous verse, 
Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith alone, apart from the deeds of the law. A decade later, Paul had resurfaced in Istanbul, having reverted to Judaism, and changed his name again. Not back to Shmuel, the name he had abandoned in favor of Paul, but rather to Shavuel, to mark his repentance, to return. But it wasn't only desperate publishers or Jewish converts who were willing to steal Luther's work for Catholic use. Luther himself complained about the papists who declared him a heretic, even while being happy to repackage his, to repackage his translation under their own name. For Yiddish translators of the New Testament in the 17th and 18th centuries, most of whom were German Protestant missionaries, the model, Halich had said, was just too easy to resist. They also obscured this larceny, as so many others had done, by propagating the fiction that as good Protestants, they were translating, as Luther had, directly from the Hebrew and Greek. <laughs> But the most sustained efforts to proselytize Jews through New Testament translations occurred in the 19th and 20th century and were initiated by British rather than German missionaries. In the two centuries since the British and Foreign Bible Society was founded in London in 1804, the Bible in whole or in part was translated into nearly 2,000 languages. Among these were a significant number in Jewish languages. By 1851, the Bible Society reported translations not only into Hebrew and Yiddish, but also into but also into Judeo-Spanish, Judeo-German, Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Persian. Um, Bible societies also produced a number of parallel editions designed to appeal to Jews, with the Hebrew New Testament on the right, and German, French, Hungarian, Italian, Russian, Polish, Turkish, English, Romanian, Portuguese, or Yiddish on the left-facing page. Aside from these Bible translations, missionaries also published and continue to publish other materials, including stories directed to Jewish children. In many respects, these Jewish language translations were no different than the thousand other Bible translations produced by Bible societies. As part of the founding principle of Bible societies, um, these translations skirt doctrinal controversy by avoiding notes or commentary. But just as in other translations directed toward non-Jews, editors and publishers find ways around these restrictions to communicate with specific readers. Bible societies publish not only official reports, but also more popular fundraising publications, which featured sentimental stories of the powerful effect of the New Testament on Jews as on other prospective converts. Thus, one missionary reported that a Jewish woman described the Yiddish New Testament as heavenly words, which are so comforting to a widow's heart. Another missionary described approaching Jewish immigrants on board a ship bound for America who were so eager to hear the Christian message that they fought for a New Testament in Yiddish. For all the congruence between the broader project of global evangelism and the mission for the Jews, the translations produced for Jews inevitably had some unique characteristics given the special nature of the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. Jews were particularly prized converts, as evidenced by references in Bible society literature to the ministry of special importance. In some varieties of evangelical Christianity, the conversion of the Jews played a crucial role in visions of Jesus' second coming, amplifying the stakes for missionaries aiming at Jews. Within Bible societies themselves, Jewish-born converts were valued as informants and language experts not only in the target languages of missionary publications and in the cultural peculiarities of the populations missionaries targeted, um, which, which is a role they shared with other converts and native informants the world over. In the case of Jews, they also provided expertise in the sources to be translated, 
in the biblical exegesis that could ease a translator's task, and in the Jewish culture that was the background of the New Testament. These roles had deep roots in historical Christian reliance on Jewish sources, but they held new importance in the millennialist context of the spread of Bible societies. Jews were more likely than other converts to rise in the ranks of Bible societies. One prominent example is Isaac Salkinson, a Russian-born convert who worked on the New Testament in Hebrew, um, and was also the first Hebrew translator of both Milton and Shakespeare. His associate, Christian David Ginsburg, another Russian-born convert and Bible scholar, acted in the Liverpool chapter of the London Mission to the Jews, completed Salkinson's Hebrew New Testament after his death. The work of these prominent and educated converts delighted missionaries and raised hopes that other Jews would follow. Thus, the Scottish Home and Foreign Mission record reported in 1895 on the European distribution and circulation of tens of thousands of Salkinson Ginsburg Bibles. Appending to this, the hopeful description of a Rabbi Lichtenstein who had recently preached the gospel in a synagogue in Budapest, which is like me talking about Yiddish in this chapter. <laughs> the report concluded, Surely it is the part of the Church of Scotland to not stand idly by, but to do her part in the great ingathering that is at hand. This mission to the Jews was not only a matter of correcting the Jewish blindness toward Christ, but indeed, I quote, a gift to Israel in recognition of what the Jews have given the world in the Hebrew Bible and in Jesus. The report added that support for the Scottish mission would also quote unquote, atone in some measure for the errors and misdeeds of the past in the church's treatment of the Jews. Scottish Christians could do no better to right these wrongs than to send in contributions to help house missionaries in areas with large Jewish populations. Similar language appears everywhere in the literature of the Jewish mission, and it's worth tracing its implicit economy. The Old Testament is the Jewish gift to the world, and it's only just that this gift be repaid by a commensurate Christian one, the New Testament in a Jewish language. But if this New Testament is somewhat shorter than the one the Jews bestowed on the world, it has the added power of saving Jewish souls by correcting Jewish error. This redemption, the word redemption, we should recall, has economic as well as theological resonance. It tones not for the sin of Jewish deicide, tactfully unmentioned in most Bible society publications, <laughs> but rather for the Christian sins of historic persecution of Europe's Jews. But if charges of Jewish murder remain outside this discourse, the Jewish perception of the New Testament as not a gift, but a threat, part and parcel of the errors and misdeeds of the past, is similarly unmentioned. The gift economy of the mission to the Jews is only half the story. The unique relationship between Christianity and Judaism, in which Jews are both targets of eschatological hopes and sources of Christian genetic anxieties also reflected itself on the linguistic level of missionary translation. On the one hand, Christianity was more familiar to Jews than it was to, say, the New Caledonians or to the Thai. Jews had long lived among Christians and shared a sacred text and many religious concepts with them. Unlike Mongolian, for instance, which lacked words not only for Messiah and for Sabbath, but also for palm tree and pomegranate, <laughs> Jewish languages possessed a rich vocabulary from which a translator could draw. These were perhaps more lexical than semantic or pragmatic equivalents. Is it really true that the Jews share with Christians the word Messiah or Sabbath? For some translators, though, there could be no doubt about these resonances. Translators rendering the New Testament in Hebrew sometimes reported that their experiences were less translation than retroversion, that is, 
uncovering the lost original of a translated text, or maybe we should call it pseudo-retroversion. The Baptist minister, Robert Lindsay, not the mayor of New York, working on the Hebrew Gospel of Mark in Jerusalem in the 1960s, wrote that his work gave him the frightening feeling that I was as much in the process of restoring an original Hebrew work as in creating a new one. And he spoke of the tantalizing possibility that he was discovering the exact words of Jesus himself. For Matthew, the gospel richest in Hebraisms and sometimes believed, I mean not anymore generally, to be a Greek translation of an original Hebrew text, this effect was even more pronounced. Pronounced Verse 121, which I know you all know, and he shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins, King James Version, actually makes sense only in Hebrew translation. The language in which the etymological connection between the name Jesus and the concept of salvation is clear, as in Salkins and Ginsburg. Vihi yoledet ben mekarata et shemo Yeshua ki hu Yoshia et amo mechatotehem. Mm -hmm. But all Jewish languages have Hebrew components which might be mobilized to produce a similarly uncanny effect. For Yiddish, such a recovery effort could only be achieved as long as translators were willing to leave behind the familiar canonical Luther Bible and mobilize a more idiomatic, more Jewish Yiddish, one which drew more fully on its Hebrew component. Such a fully Jewish Yiddish New Testament appeared only with the 1941 publication of, oops, that was my um, uncanny, Word prayer and Hebrew. There was my guy. Uh, it only appeared with the 1941 publication of Der Bris Kadasha by Henry Chaim Einspruch. Typically, missionary Bibles find retranslation much sooner with the first generation of Christian converts who are also native speakers discovering the mistakes and infelicities of the first missionary efforts. Why the long delay then in producing a more idiomatic Yiddish translation? It was actually almost exactly 400 years. <laughs> certainly, the, the long, certainly the strong pull of Luther's canonical German New Testament and the ease with which it could be rendered in Hebrew letters played a part. It's also true that missionaries share a sense with converts and beginning with the Enlightenment Jewish intellectuals too, that Yiddish wasn't actually a language, it was a jargon, a jargon. It's hard to overstate the stigma that surrounded Yiddish, the visceral distaste of non-Jews and acculturated Jews for what was considered what Damiron calls the language of Caliban, Caliban, a horrendously mispronounced, ungrammatical mishmash of various languages spoken by the unwashed Jewish masses because they had no access to a more civilized tongue. Could the sacred words of the New Testament really be poured into so flawed, dirty, and unesthetic a vessel? And I'll just point out that there's, I just read somewhere that Jesus himself is considered to have spoken something like a Galilean Yiddish <laughs> and then, I mean, Aramaic, Hebrew, but, you know, not from the educated classes. And that the reason that the New Testament is in, is in Greek is to avoid having to produce this patois. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a different story. It was true that Yiddish-speaking Jews could hardly understand missionaries who used the Yiddish corrected toward German and in Yiddish-speaking circles, when you say that someone's speaking missionary Yiddish, it's not a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, missionaries persisted, since as one German missionary put it, a Yiddish purified toward German 
is already a step toward a Judaism purified toward Christianity. With this logic, a New Testament in Germanized Yiddish paved the way to the baptismal font. In some sense, it already embodied the, tra the, the transformation that it hoped to effect. The man who inaugurated a new era of Yiddish New Testament translation, Henry Chaim Eichmann, was born into a Sansa Basidic home in Poland, spent the years 1909 to 1911 in Palestine as a labor Zionist, returned to Poland, met the guy who would teach him about Christ and embrace Christianity, immigrated um, in 1913 to, to, to the United States, graduated from McCormick Theological Seminary in 1920, and embarked on, the, on a mission to the Jewish community of Baltimore that he clung to for the rest of his life. Notice that I haven't exactly mentioned his conversion for the reason that, any guesses? Einspruch never converted to Christianity, deeming his allegiance that seemed like the right illustration here. <laughs> Deeming his allegiance to evangelical Lutherism a true fulfillment and completion of his Judaism rather than apostasy or betrayal. He married an Amish woman, Marie Erlock, who died about 10 years ago at the age of 104. They communicated in, in an odd marital idiolect she spoke to him in Pennsylvania Dutch. He spoke to her in Polish Yiddish. Einspruch achieved a certain infamy in Baltimore for standing on a soapbox in front of various Orthodox synagogues on Shabbos, preaching the good news in Yiddish. He'd say, Yeshua Taiva, Yeshua Nightsley, to those leaving services. Despite Einstein's affiliation with the United Lutheran Church, the new translation left Luther far behind. Its model was actually the Yiddish translation of the Hebrew Bible by Hirsch, Solomon Bloomgarten, which was handed down on Mount Bronx in 1926 to great acclaim. <laughs> The main difference between Einspruch's New Testament and Yehoiash's Hebrew Bible is that Einspruch's Yiddish is more persistently Jewish. And I, maybe I should just explain to you that is that Yiddish actually, it's, 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 it's not like, I guess it is like being pregnant. It's, there, are more, there are more and less Jewish ways of speaking Yiddish. Um, and, uh, and you can really infuse it with a lot of Hebrew, a lot of, um, let's say, in many cases you can choose a German word or a Yiddish term for the same word. So the word, you could say manat for month, or you could say chaydish for month. Um, and if you say chaydish and you consistently choose the Hebraic component, your Yiddish will sound more Orthodox, more Jewish, Einspruch's Yiddish New Testament is simply more Jewish than Yehoiash's Yiddish Hebrew Bible. I don't know how else to say that. Um, for example, um, so Einspruch, he, he, he hewed very closely to Hayesh's high modernist literary style, and he quoted him whenever he needed to cite the Old Testament. But he also added that homier, more Jewish element that's missing from Yehoiash, whose project was to produce a worldly cultural Bible, to take John Sheen's term, for secular Jews. The resulting effect is that, again, of the two great 20th century Yiddish Bible translation projects, Einspruchs and Yehoiash's, the Yiddish New Testament is more Jewish than the Yiddish Hebrew Bible. And just as an example, Yehoiash translated the Hebrew word sefer, which means a holy book, as buch, which means a book. 
German derived book. Einspruch translated the Greek word biblios, biblios as safer, not buch. <laughs> biblios, of, of course, was probably the Greek translation for the Hebrew word safer. But that seems not to have occurred to Yiddish translators before Einspruch. Einspruch's work can also be compared not only to Yehoash, but also to its immediate predecessor, Bergman's widely circulated The Znaya Testament. Um, like every other Yiddish translator before Einspruch, it stayed in Luther's shadow. Um, Bergman translates Biblios as book. He also neglects the opportunity at every turn um, to remind his readers that Jesus was a rabbi. Thus, Bergman's disciples addressed Jesus as Lever or Meister, and his title for the Book of Acts following Luther is the Apostelgeschichte. Einstein's disciples always called Jesus Rebbe, and the Book of Acts is rendered as the Meister from the Schlichem. A time that was significantly more Jewish and even Hasidic resonance. Where Jesus at the Last Supper took bread and blessed it in the King James Version and in Bergman, Einspruch's Yeshua makes a bracha over the matzah. The seven angels in the book of Revelations blow seven trumpets on Judgment Day, whatever that is. Einspruch's angels, more Jewish apparently, Blow Zibin Shifrites, seven shofars. It's not just that the Hebraic component of Einstein's translation is richer than Bergman's and others. His Hebrew was also better, more idiomatic, even than that of the widely praised Salkinson Ginsberg. When Jesus comes to fulfill the Torah in Matthew 5, the Salkinson Ginsberg has Limalota Ta Torah. While Einspruch is more faithful to Jewish idiom in having Jesus mekayim the Torah, that's how you would say it. Whether or not that Hebrew phrase was somehow beneath the Greek of Matthew, it certainly rang truer as a Jewish sentiment to the average contemporary reader. In these and other decisions, Einspruch, Einspruch was reflecting not only on strictly linguistic or exegetical issues, he was also expressing his sense of the deep and close relationship between Jews and Christians, Judaism and Christianity, by drawing out the Jewish cultural and linguistic meanings that lay hidden behind the apparently hidden, I'm sorry, the apparently foreign text of the New Testament. Einspruch was also expressing his own profound sense that Judaism and Christianity stood in no necessary contradiction. As a translator, Einspruch was his, also expressing his conviction that conversion was unnecessary for Jewish Christians. In this, he participated in a broader historical trend in which Jewish Christians, whether they had converted or not, formed separate Hebrew Christian congregations in the early years of the 20th century. Later in the century, they joined Messianic Jewish congregations or Jews for Jesus, um, in which adherents, and typically in a Messianic Jewish congregation, not, every, not all the members were actually born Jews, um, but adherents proudly kept their Jewish names if they were lucky enough to have one, or took on new Jewish names if they weren't so lucky. It was only within this cultural and linguistic environment that the first truly idiomatic Yiddish New Testament could be written. For all Einstein's sense of the closeness of Judaism and Christianity, he could hardly avoid dealing with the fissures in that picture, which already appear in the text itself, and not only in its afterlife. The Gospel of John, you knew that would come up, is no doubt the most, shall we say, challenging to Jewish ears, and neither Salkinson Ginsburg nor Einstein could do much to render John's reports about the persecuting blind Jews, Hayudim, the Eden, more palatable to Jewish ears. It's only more recently that I think people have discovered these workarounds of the 
the Judeans or the Jewish leaders or the Jewish authorities, etc. They didn't for for the word that's translated as the Jews. Hoy you die hoy. But if the as a, as we say in Yiddish. But if the Yiddish Gospel of John posed the challenge of attracting Jewish readers, it may have had the virtue of reflecting its translators' own charged circumstances. The notion that Judaism and Christianity are rival siblings or twins, battling even before their birth, has deep roots in both rabbinic and patristic sources. But with the parting of the ways, this sibling rivalry became largely metaphorical except, that is, for Jewish converts to Christianity. For Einspruch, son of a Sansa Hasid, the adoption of Christianity brought him into open conflict with actual kin, friends, former friends, parents, comrades, colleagues. escape these tensions, but after his time in the seminary, Einspruch took up residence in the very heart of Baltimore's Orthodox neighborhood, apparently rel reveling in his proximity to Jews, well, no doubt, if we can picture the reception he received, also absorbing their abuse. The book of John, in which the Jews cruelly persecute a good Jewish man whose only crime is that he yearns to redeem their souls, may have been an expression of Einspruch's own experience of Christianity mm -hmm. rather than a challenge to his ability to attract Jewish readers. It's not John, but rather Paul, I'd argue, that poses the greatest challenge for Jewish Christian translators. As Martin Buber points out, Paul's theology rests heavily on a prior translation or mistranslation in the Septuagint, in which the Hebrew word Torah, which means everything, <laughs> is rendered in the Greek as nomos, which is usually translated into English as law. Without the change of meaning in the Greek sense, Buba writes, the Pauline dualism of law and faith, life from works and life from grace, would miss its most important presupposition. Law may have its opposites in faith and grace, but Torah easily absorbs these concepts in its more capacious grasp. For translators of Paul into Hebrew or Yiddish, nomos seem to find a ready equivalent in the term Torah, restoring the Jewish concept that clearly lay behind nomos. The return to Torah Indeed, works beautifully when Jesus speaks of himself as the fulfillment of Torah. But the strategy fall, falls apart when it's Paul doing the talking. Paul's theology sets himself up not as the fulfillment of, but rather, a victim, but rather as a victory over the law. And it's only the narrower term that allows Paul to see nomos as something so unpleasant that humans need to be rescued from it. Einspruch discovers a lexical equivalent, indeed performs an apparent retroversion, but he fails to take into account the pragmatic, semantic associations of each term in its respective culture. Whatever the dictionary says or the Septuagint believes, Torah is not nomos, nomos is not Torah. Translation history cannot be so easily reversed once a community of interpretation has been built on it. When Paul's letters to the, letter to the Galatians assures his readers that Christ redeemed them from the curse of the law, the Hebrew or Yiddish translations, translation renders Paul not less, but rather more difficult to swallow for his Jewish, if not his Galatian readers. Einspruch renders this pivotal theological claim, Mashiach hat uns euskeles, or in Salkinson Ginsburg, Hamashiach Pada et Nafshenu Me Kilalat HaTorah. Let me translate into Yiddish, which I think you probably all understand. Mashiach saved us from the curse of the Torah. 
Unlike the promise that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, this sentence is not so much offensive as nonsensical, combining recognizably Jewish terms in ways that their internal Jewish significations rule out. Such ostensible recovery projects as Einspruch's Yiddish version of Galatians may have attempted to demonstrate how embedded Pauline Christianity was within Jewish sources, but precisely by translation into Jewish idiom, it also rendered visible the chasm that separated Paul from the world of rabbinic and traditional values and continued to separate Einspruch from his Orthodox family and neighbors. Missionary translators like Einspruch, who were working within this complex field of resonance and fissure, equivalence and difference, had a double task. To mobilize the closeness of Judaism and Christianity wherever it existed, while sidestepping those places in which Judaism and Christianity, Jews and Christians, had gone their radically separate ways. And they had to do so without the aid of prefaces and commentaries, as the Bible societies ruled. While keeping to the letter of this law, missionary translators managed to evade its spirit, conveying theologically charged material not only through translation choices, but also through epigraphs, advertisements, illustrations, and book covers. I somehow managed to misplace that book jacket. Thus, while missionaries focused their attention on distributing the New Testament to Jews, since Jews could find their Hebrew Bibles elsewhere, the translations they circulate, circulated worked to telegraph the connection between the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, even in the color of, this is a sort of typical color, I think, of a, of a safer. Um, so both Bergman's Dasnaya Testament and, and Einspruch's Der Brizcha Dasha open with a well-chosen epigraph from Jeremiah promising in Hebrew and Yiddish translation that God will establish a new covenant, Brizcha Dasha, or Anayin Bund in Yehayash, um, with the house of Israel and Judah. That phrase appears five times in the New Testament, but by choosing their epigraph from the Hebrew Bible, Bergman and Einspruch strive to link the New Testament with a text more canonical for Jews, making a theological and psychological claim on potential Jewish readers. These tactics let them know that the book they're holding has been promised by God to them in their Torah, however dangerous and unfamiliar the New Testament might feel to them. The strategies that characterize the, mission, the Christian mission to the Jews reflect more than theological sympathies or lack of sympathies between the religion. It was well known on both sides of the missionary enterprise that the Jews felt for Christianity a visceral distrust that was undoubtedly harder to overcome than the simple ignorance that missionaries encountered in other contexts. The missionary report about Jews fighting for a New Testament on board a ship bound for America concluded with a much more credible complaint about a certain rabbi on board who tried to stop these Jews from even touching the book. <laughs> Einspruch was able to find an American Yiddish, was unable to find an American Yiddish press willing to print his translation and was compelled to raise money to purchase his own press. The press was pretty much monopolized by Orthodox printers. Um, the press was paid for by another Jewish Christian, longtime supporter, Harriet Letterer, and it was donated to the National Jewish Book Center in the 1980s. No more news for it. Jews tended to have a, a double relationship with Christian missionaries. On the one hand, rejection and hostility at the perceived threat of Christian mis mission. On the other hand, a proud dismissal of the paltry number of converts that resulted from missionary efforts. <laughs> In the 18th century, Yeshiva boys searched out copies of Christian Muller's abridged Yiddish New Testament and consigned them to the flames. And while we know from missionary reports that roughly three quarters of a million Yiddish New Testament were distributed over the 19th and 20th centuries, 
A folkloric counter-discourse describes this flood of books having ended up being used to wrap fish, or worse. <laughs> Levi Eshkol, attempting to quiet public hysteria, can we call it, about missionary activities in the state of Israel in a 1964 Knesset address, tried to put the issue into perspective by noting that in Israel, only 201 Jews had converted either to Christianity or to Islam since 1948, a period in which over 4,000 Christians and Muslims had converted to Judaism. <laughs> not bad for a religion that took pride in not even seeking converts. <laughs> but who's keeping score? <laughs> But it seems to me that Jews often fail to understand that missionaries do not count success by the number of converts they make. The missionary enterprise is not a business plan based on a cost-benefit analysis, but rather an integral expression of evangelical identity. Translators generally saw the exegetical and literary exercises at the basis of their work as its own reward, even if they continued to hope that the uncanny effect of a Hebrew-speaking Matthew, or, so help me, a Yiddish-speaking John, would not be lost on Jewish readers. I don't even know what that slide is doing there, so don't worry about it. <laughs> For translated converts, the act of translation also established their sincerity and usefulness to their new communities and symbolically expressed the fantasy of Jewish Christian reconciliation. Translation was thus a kind of performance, functioning as the embodiment of certain theological principles concerning the relationship between Judaism, Ju Jesus and Judaism, the Old and New Testaments, the Hebraic substratum underlying the Greek of the Gospels, and so on. Missionary translations, in their textual conflation of Jewish language and Christian content, were in this sense already achieved conversions, whatever effect they may have had in the real world. These translations as conversions could take different forms. First, Germanizing the ugly jargon of Yiddish-speaking Jews in proper New Testament Germanized Yiddish, and then, with Einspruch's dramatic reversal of this technique, Judaizing Christianity by restoring to Jesus his original Jewish speech and world. Art designers participated um, in, in the project of forging a Jewish New Testament, fashioning books designed to look at home on a traditional Jewish bookshelf. The beautiful second edition of Einspruch's Briska Dasha features a Star of David on the cover and is lavishly illustrated um, by artwork taken without permission from the instantly recognizable work of the Jewish artist and illustrator Ephraim Moshe, uh, Moshe Lillian. Lillian's oeuvre contains a range of Jewish images from representations of biblical scenes to modern uh, images and most famously Zionist iconography. But the publishers of the second edition ignored images that might evoke Jewish life in first century Palestine choosing rather from Lillian's representation of traditional Jewish iconography, and more particularly, images of traditional Jews. Mm -hmm. Thus, the letter to the Hebrews, and there are the Hebrews, <laughs> suggests that Paul was writing not to his own contemporaries, but rather to the Jews in the Renaissance, etc. And the Vesura like Machia, opens with the rendering of a pious old Jewish man wearing a yarmulke, wrapped in a talus, providing a visual echo of the word Sefer in the first line. Thus is the Sefer from the Mithras to Yeshua, Mashiach, etc. I'm not going to read the whole New Testament to you. <laughs> Einstein's translation choice and the illustration together signify that this is a Sefer and not a book much less the trade puzzle that traditional Jewish culture generally considers the New Testament to be. And maybe it's not nice to translate that word. 
<laughs> the image that opens Einspruch's New Testament, then, is an illustration not of the text that it accompanies, but rather of its ideal reception, imagining, and in some, and in some sense, supplying the traditional Jewish reader, Einspruch's father, who will fulfill Einspruch's eschatological hope that Jews would embrace the New Testament as an authentic part of their heritage. The actual, rather than imaginary, reception of Einspruch's translation may be rather surprising. Despite the financial and logistical difficulties Einspruch encountered in getting his translation printed, when the translation finally appeared, it was greeted with admiration and respect in the Yiddish literary press. Einspruch got an especially warm review from the Polish, Mexican, Canadian, Yiddish poet, Mel Travers. <laughs> like to say, just to be clear, despite his failure to submit to the baptismal font, Einspruch was no liberal or progressive Jewish Christian but rather a passionate believer in the dispensational millennialist creed in its Lutheran evangelical form, as well as a tireless, and no doubt tiresome, missionary. <laughs> Ravitch, on the other hand, was a secular Yiddish modernist, a champion of Spinoza, a critic of both Zionism and traditional Judaism, who was committed to a worldly, cosmopolitan, diaspora Jewish nationalism. Nevertheless, Re Ravitch's review makes no mention of Einspruch's missionary efforts, focusing rather on the closeness of Einspruch's New Testament and Yehoash's Yiddish translation of the Hebrew Bible, and calling the translation beautiful and the translator a master of the finest nuances of the language. Ravitch delicately continues, for well-known reasons, the New Testament has remained for many of us Jews a book sealed with seven seals. And that is truly a pity, for to some 700 million people, it's a sacred work. A cultured person should know such a work. I recommend it to every intelligent Jew. This new translation, in Ravitch's view, was a welcome contribution to Yiddish literature in some ways, indeed, a gift to the Jewish people. The positive reviews of Einspruch's translation are even more remarkable given the outcry that had greeted the publication just a year before of the English translation of the Nazarene, Sholem Asha's novel that explores the Jewishness of Jesus. Among the other sins, Ash was accused of apostasy and of having written a piece of missionary propaganda. But apostasy, in Ash's case, had a secular Yiddishist meaning rather than a religious Jewish meaning. Ash's great sin was not proselytizing, but rather having published first an English translation because he couldn't find a publisher. I mean, a printer, actually. Einspruch, who actually was a missionary, purchased his own press to get around the boycott of his work. But when the Yiddish daily forwards refused to print the serialized Yiddish version of Der Mann von Nazareth, um, and I should add that even though the forwards was a secular socialist Yiddish journal, the entire print room was run by Orthodox Jews, um, Ash took the more treasonous route of finding an English translator. The different receptions of Ash and Einspruch must be understood then less in the context of Jewish Christian relations than within the project of modern Jewish culture. The 20th century brought literary translations not only of the Hebrew Bible, but also of Byron, Dostoevsky, Goethe, Gogol. Gogol, Hugo, Kipling, the Quran, Lao Tzu, Shakespeare, Shaw, Mark, Twain, Oscar Wilde, Zola, and many others. On such a diverse bookshelf, why not a, Jew a Yiddish New Testament? In fact, modern Jewish intellectuals, artists, and writers often took a special interest in Christianity. 
The Yiddish literary reclamation of Jesus had many significations and motivations. It signified the belated Jewish entry into the European literary tradition. It was an assertion of Jewish literary universalism. It served as a bitterly ironic commentary on the Christian persecution of Jews. It worked as a critique of Jewish prejudices against other religions. It expressed a sincere embrace of Jesus' ethical principles. It rebelled against Jewish parochialism and parents and reminded Christians of the Jewish roots of their religion. What the modern use of Christian images in Jewish literature almost never did mean was apostasy. The term of apostasy and the scale of secular Yiddish values was reserved for those who abandoned the project of enriching Yiddish culture. Those who actually became Christian could be forgiven as long as their Christianity took the form of a beautiful Yiddish style. <laughs> Einspruch's project resonated within modernist Yiddish culture for even more specific reasons. Einspruch shared with the secular Yiddish intelligentsia an appreciation for a literary Yiddish freed from its dependence on and subjugation to German in which Hebraic synonyms were to be preferred, and the distinctive shape that Yiddish had taken as it moved eastward and lost its connections to the German language were preserved. In the case of Yiddish modernists, these language ideologies served to construct the national tongue of Jewish coherence and integrity. In the case of Einspruch, the same preference for Yiddish linguistic autonomy worked to construct a more Jewish Jesus. The rapprochement envisioned by convert translators on Jewish Christian religious grounds thus indeed took place, only not on the religious soil Einstein had plowed. Remarkably, the secular Yiddish poet was able to counter Einstein's missionary zeal with something more powerful than dismissal and abuse. The calm acknowledgement that Yiddish culture was commodious enough to welcome the contributions of even this Yiddish speaker. In the year of our Lord, 1941, the cosmopolitan Spinozist and the evangelical missionary welcomed with one voice a Jesus who spoke Yiddish, if only for the briefest moment. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi, for that wonderful lecture. Professor Seidman's. Seidman has, uh, mm, I don't have quite enough light here, sorry. Oh, my bad. Oh, that phone? Can you have a phone with the light? Seidman's fine lecture. That's the end of the formality. <laughs> <laughs> After this, she's dear Naomi. <laughs> um, has shown us the emergence of a strategy in the long saga of Christian attempts to proselytize Jews. Why did this project seem so urgent to Christian leaders over generations and centuries? Several possible answers range from social to psychological to theological. Probably, the answer must be all of the above. On the social level, in the early centuries of the Common Era, Judaism, an ancient and honorable religion, commanded much more respect than did Christianity, a new religious movement. Judaism occupied a privileged social niche in the Roman Empire, a niche that Christian leaders sought to appropriate. Not share, appropriate. Mm. On the psychological level in relation to Jews, Christians evidenced the most intimate and deeply rooted of hostilities, namely sibling rivalry, in Naomi's words, simultaneous affinity and aversion. On the theological level, supersessionist theology, 
according to which Christians claim to have, quote, inherited and fulfilled Hebrew scriptures, as well as some of Judaism's ritual practices, was embarrassingly undermined by the continuing presence of Judaism. If Jews could be quietly tucked into the Christian fold, such claims would seem to have more legitimacy. Leaders such as Augustine and Hippo worked overtime to position Judaism in relation to Christianity. The Jew, Augustine wrote, carries the book from which the Christian takes his faith. They have become our librarians, like slaves who carry books behind their masters." He taught that the whole content of Jewish scriptures is either directly or indirectly about Christ. Judaism, he said, was a foreshadowing of Christianity. The New Testament lies hidden in the Old. The Old Testament becomes plain in the New." End quote. When such flamboyant efforts of argument disguised as exegesis fail to result in mass conversions, Augustine, like Luther many centuries later, turned, as revealed in the title of his late treatise, against the Jews. Naomi has spared us a recital of the incredibly short steps from Christian attempts to convert Jews to murderous violence. I'll also spare us a recital of those. Shortage of time is my excuse to avoid a narration of the utterly horrifying effects of anti-Jewish rhetoric from the New Testament forward. For medieval and early modern evidence, I'll simply refer you to San Francisco Theological Seminary Professor Christopher Auker's important 1998 article, Ritual Murder and the Subjectivity of Christ, in which he shows that medieval increments of new devotions to the Passion of Christ, such as Corpus Christi devotions, were inevitably accompanied by violence against Jews. Fast forward to the present. I was a hospice volunteer for seven years. One of my patients, the 90-year-old daughter of immigrant Russian Jews, let's call her Sylvia because that was her name, <laughs> told me one day about her childhood experiences of being taunted and ostracized in a school playground in Chicago with the repetitious chant, you killed Jesus. Mm -hmm. I told her, Jews didn't kill Jesus, Romans did. She replied sadly, why didn't I know that 85 years ago? Mm -hmm. Well, Sylvia didn't know that 85 years ago because of what Hans Georg Rademer has called the effective history of an idea. Gadamer insisted that the history of the use of an idea must be part of the interpretation of that idea. I once heard a lecture, not at GTU, and by a scholar who will remain unnamed, on a New Testament passage attributed to Paul in which, quote, the Jews are accused of killing Jesus. The lecture claimed with the scholarly air of finally resolving a major misunderstanding, can you picture it? That Paul did not intend to implicate all Jews, only those who participated directly in Jesus' trial and crucifixion. Well, apparently this point was lost on generations of Christians who participated in the effective history of that allegation. An important moment in that effective, effective history was Martin Luther's 1543 treatise against the Jews and their lives, published three years 
after the Krakow Yiddish translation. Circulation of Luther's anti-Judaism was expedited by his vigorous use of a 16th century new technology, namely the printing press. In his treatise, Luther urged that Jewish synagogues and homes should be burned, and all evidence of Jewish ritual and teachings either burned or buried, and that rabbis be forbidden to teach, quote, on pain of loss of life and limb, end quote. He advocated that German princes should deny safe conduct and protection to Jews, and that Jews should be expelled from German principalities. Recently, several scholars have studied the effective history of Luther's treatise, from its publication in the mid-16th century to the mid-20th century, when Hitler quoted parts of it in his speeches in Nazi rallies. Today, Lutheran groups around the world have publicly repudiated and repented Luther's anti-Judaism acknowledging that it is, quote, not a fringe issue, but a sad and dishonorable part of Luther's legacy, end quote. Mm. Professor Simon's lecture has shown us a relatively benign moment in the Christian effort to proselytize Jews, a moment that must, however, be understood in the context of a very long effective history. She observes that in translation of the New Testament, notes and commentary were omitted in order, quote, to avoid doctrinal controversy. But intentions are not the same as effects. Those of us who study texts, both in translation and in their language of origin, recognize that translations heavily scented by the translator's multiple choices are, even without notes and commentary, already interpretations. Indeed, that is why scholars learn the languages of the text we study, so that we recognize that translations are interpretations. In conclusion, I want to remind us of a very interesting suggestion that Naomi has made. She said that the effectiveness of translations of the New Testament into Yiddish and other languages that were spoken and read by Jews should not be evaluated by the admittedly paltry number of converts that may have been uh, produced. Rather, these translations should be understood in her words as performative rather than instrumental. A subtle point, but highly important. Missionizing translations were themselves, in her words again, already achieved Jewish Christian conversions in their textual conflation of the Jewish and the Christian, end quote. In short, the Yiddish New Testament was, quote, not a medium of communication, but the message itself. If Jewish people proved impervious to conversion, then a text, in its passivity and vulnerability, already noted by Plato, could be converted by its conflation of Jewish and Christian. Here is a cautionary tale that should alert all of us who translate texts not only to the politics, but also to the ethics of translation. Thank you, Naomi, for a truly distinguished 2017 faculty lecture. Unfortunately, we don't have time for uh, Q&A because we have to spend about an hour 
uh, participating reception in honor of Dr. Uh, Naomi Sai. So again, please join me in congratulating Dr. Naomi.